Good morning, I'm Andrew Pappas from the Phoenix Lawyers Chapter, and it's my privilege to introduce our second panel, Do Citizens Still Trust the Democratic Process? Uh, the panel is going to be moderated this morning by the Honorable Michael T. Liberti. Judge Liberti is a judge on the U.S. District Court for the District of Arizona in Phoenix. Before his judicial service, Judge Liberti was a lawyer in private practice, most recently at Greenberg Traurig. Before that, he served for three years as general counsel to Governor Doug Ducey of Arizona. Judge Liberti received his undergraduate and law degrees from Arizona State University and served as a law clerk to Justice Ruth McGregor on the Arizona Supreme Court. Judge Liberti. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to introduce this panel with a quick uh, personal story. When I was a second year law student engaged in the on-campus interview process, it was September of 2020, and I made the mistake of pitching to big law firms and big law firm partners the idea that I wanted to do constitutional law and political <laughs> law, um, campaign finance, arguing about the Constitution, and nobody really knew what I was talking about. Um, but I still was successful, and I ended up getting an offer um, at a wonderful firm. But what ended up happening just a few months after my on-campus interview experience was this little case called Bush versus Gore. And Bush versus Gore ushered in the legitimacy and um, the mainstreaming of political law and litigation. And since that time, and, and again about, about nine years or so later, 10 years later, the Citizens United case just um, you know, added more fuel to the fire. Since then though, political law and litigation has become a big part of many major law firms' practices. It involves campaign finance consulting, uh, consulting and litigation over the election process, consulting, drafting, uh, and litigation over state initiatives, uh, litigation over petition signatures, strategic litigation to get your opponents thrown off the ballot, that is, um, and many, many other things, including um, constitutional and other legal challenges to state voting laws. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about on this panel is whether the uh, mainstreaming of election-related litigation has resulted in a decrease of trust among voters. And many of the panelists here have some very interesting and thoughtful ideas and theories. I'm going to introduce our panelists now. To my right is Audrey Perry Martin, and she is a national and California-based political law expert. She has nearly 20 years of experience. She practices in the area of advising corporations, candidates, political action committees, political parties, and major campaign donors in the area of political and election law. Her current firm is the Gober Group, and prior to that, she gained knowledge and experience at the Federal Election Commission, working for Congress. She's worked at a think tank and at private law firms in Washington, D.C. and California, and she has ex extensive national political law experience, having served as counsel for the McCain-Palin campaign and as de de uh, deputy general, general counsel for Senator Romney's presidential campaigns in 2008 and 2012. She's taught election law at Brigham Young University Law School, and she serves as the uh, Vice President of Judicial Affairs at the Republican National Lawyers Association. She received her law degree from Georgetown University Law Center and her bachelor's degree in political science and journalism from Brigham Young. To Audrey's right is Bradley Schrager. He is a political and election lawyer for Las Vegas, Nevada. And for the last 15 years, he has represented political parties, <coughs> candidates, PACs, 
and other political actors in pre- and post-election matters, largely but not exclusively on behalf of Democrats. He has a bachelor's degree from Washington University and a doctorate from Northwestern and a law degree from Notre Dame. Now, at the end is my fellow Arizonan, Stephen Richer. He is the elected Republican uh, Maricopa County reporter, and he is statutorily responsible for document recordation, voter registration, and early voting in Maricopa County, Arizona which is home to 4.6 million residents and is the second largest voting jurisdiction in the United States. Stephen previously worked in business and as a transactional attorney. He has received his Bachelor's of Arts from Tulane, his Master's and JD from the University of Chicago, and he is completing his PhD in Arizona, at Arizona State University. Stephen was named Arizonan of the Year by the Arizona Republic in 2021, Republican Politician of the Year by the Phoenix New Times in 2021, Public Lawyer of the Year by the Maricopa County Bar Association in 2022, and Leader of the Year in Government by the Arizona Capital Times in 2023. What an impressive panel we have here today. Let's begin with Audrey. All right, thank you. I'm excited to be here today on this panel and talk about this important topic. Um, we're really experiencing a crisis at election. A large percentage of Americans simply don't believe that when their preferred candidate loses, that the results were fair. On the political right, they cry fraud. On the political left, it's voter suppression. And a loss of confidence in election isn't just this fringe concern for academics and lawyers. If citizens don't believe in the fairness of elections, the entire system of democracy can collapse. And yet these beliefs are almost completely disconnected from reality. Um, by almost any standard, fraud in American elections is relatively trivial. It's not very common. And certainly nothing near enough to influence a presidential election where almost 15 or more than 15 million people, 150 million people cast ballots, sorry. And contrary to claims of suppression, there have never been fewer obstacles to voting in the United States. But voters, politicians, public officials seem obsessed with election administration issues. State legislatures across the country are proposing bills and passing bills at an incredible pace. Um, according to the National Conference of State Legislatures election bill tracking database, um, I just checked it this morning, there's over 400 election related bills that have been introduced in state legislatures in 2024. That's, we haven't even had a month of 2024, right? And we're already at over 400 bills. Um, there's always gonna be a tension between making voting more accessible and making sure elections are able to run smoothly and securely. It's a trade-off of risk, the risk of voter fraud versus the risk of some people having a difficult time voting. Uh, certainly, states need to have reasonable, flexible, common sense regulation designed to provide order and legitimacy to the election process. Um, I've been watching the past few legislative sessions very closely, and it seems like the opposite is happening. Red states and blue states are drifting further and further apart on how they administer elections. Election procedure bills are in, being introduced at this incredible pace, and some of them are haphazardly written, to be honest, and they seemingly without much regard to the state's election system as a whole. Um, this hyped up rhetoric between election access and election integrity is such a gross simplification of the issues, and it's really sowing doubt in the electorate about the illegitimacy of our institutions. Um, and the incentives right now are skewed towards making these issues hyper-partisan. Uh, politicians like them because it energizes their base, they can fundraise on it. Um, and it, it really is an issue that they like right now. And so they're saying things that aren't always necessarily accurate. Um, so how did we get here? The issues of voting hours, mail ballots, early voting, even voter ID didn't used to be a partisan issue. Any laws that change the voting process isn't automatically voter suppression, and any law that gives more access to voting isn't election fraud. Um, this, though, contrary to the current narrative, this started long before Donald Trump and the 2020 election. This is not just a Republican and a Trump issue. 
uh, the issue of the losing party not accepting re election results really started in 2000 with Al Gore when um, after that fiasco that many of us remember, uh, Al Gore never really conceded, he just congratulated President Bush on becoming elected, um, on becoming president, sorry, he didn't say elected. A dozen House Democrats um, in that election objected to the counting of Florida's electoral votes. Again in 2004, when Bush won again, many Democrats bought into these wild conspiracy theories about what was going on in Ohio. Um, and the Democrats again objected to counting Ohio's electoral votes. In 2016, um, House members again objected to the electoral vote count um, after Trump's victory. There were calls that the election was rigged against Hillary Clinton. Um, and of course, in 2018, Stacey Abrams turned a loss uh, in the Georgia governor's race and to an opportunity to become a celebrity in progressive circles for claiming voter fraud and suppression. So Republicans are obviously guilty of this as well. I just use those examples to show that this is not just a Republican problem. It's really both parties. Uh, Long-term polling data is showing really very little difference between Democrats and Republicans questioning election results. Um, in October 2020, so right before the 2020 election, a poll found that 44% of Democrats which was nearly identical to 45% of Republicans, uh, believed that if the other side won, fraud would have been involved. Uh, those numbers are quite astounding when you think about it. It, it was a month before the, uh, the 2020 election. So of course, of course we had problems, right? Um, voter confidence in the accuracy of the national vote count has declined over around 30% from 2000 to 2012. So before Donald Trump even <coughs> came on the scene, this was declining this confidence issue was, you know, voters were losing confidence in the election process. So why is this such a problem when the evidence of voter fraud and vote suppression is so low? Why is belief in it so high? Um, everybody's got theories. I'll share a couple of mine. First, like I said before, this has become a really popular issue for politicians to rally around and energize their bases. Um, state legislatures pass all kinds of bills to say they're doing something about the problem. Um, but this constant change of election laws is a bad idea generally. Sure, it's needed sometimes. You have to <coughs> continually update election laws as technology changes and other issues change, but our elections are generally pretty well run. Changing them up confuses voters and it makes election officials' jobs more difficult instead of actually addressing the problem. Um, every election cycle, I. I generally run legal operations for state parties in various states. Um, the past couple cycles, I've been involved in the Republican Party stuff in California. And because of this, I've talked to hundreds of voters about problems they have with voting. California keeps changing their election laws, to give one example. They move around precincts, they've instituted vote centers, they've changed the rules about ballot carrying, they keep changing ballot receipt deadlines, uh, they change how signatures are checked. Um, and, and because of this, one of the reasons this causes voters to be terrified that they're voting the wrong way. It's gotten worse every year. In 2020, it was ridiculous how concerned voters were that their vote wasn't going to count. Um, some people, tons of people ask me, what's the safest way to vote? How can I make sure my ballot's counted? And my response to them was generally, California counts just about everything. Like, they're not <laughs> gonna throw their ballot away. Um, and, but they were, they were concerned that the state was gonna use any excuse they could to throw out their ballot and not count it. Um, and these were Republican voters, so uh, that, was, that was part of the reason why they were concerned about California. But when California instituted automatic voter registration, individuals who went to the DMV had their voter registration automatically updated. Um, and if they failed to check this box, then their party affiliation was deleted. It was this complete chaos the next primary and following primaries when these lifetime Republicans showed up and they couldn't vote in the primary because they were no longer registered Republican. Um, changes to election laws almost always have unintended consequences that ripple through the system. Elections don't happen in a vacuum and these small changes can have unexpected outcome. Uh, I wanna talk quickly about mail ballots Mail ballots are great, they make it convenient to vote, but COVID forced states to immediately, didn't force, but caused states to immediately go down the path towards increased ballot, mail ballot use without really a lot of them taking sufficient time to address the complexity.
complexities that mail ballots present, they're slow. It takes a lot longer to count the votes when you have a lot of mail ballots, um, which leads to, has led to election conspiracy theories because people expect the results right away, and when they don't get them, they think the election workers are stuffing ballot boxes, um, even though there's not any evidence of that. So what can we do? We can prioritize increasing transparency in elections, um, legitimate audits of the whole process from the voter rolls to voter registration to ballot cure methods, allowing observers, as long as they're not disrupting the process, will increase confidence in elections. Um, there's lots of ways to do it, but our election process has had a spotlight on it for a couple of years, and they can't be conducted in a black box anymore. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Bradley. Sure. Yeah, Bradley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am an emissary from a remote constellation known as the left, <laughs> and a small planet uh, called election lawyer from the left, uh, but I am really very happy to be here today. You've been incredibly hospitable, uh, even though uh, you know, some of my friends back home, a, a, a Democratic consultant said, why would you go there? What do you, what do you hope to achieve there? Almost as if I was going to some, on some anthropological quest to one <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's very nice. And I said, well, this is what I said. I said, I'm going to go for two reasons. Number one, I'll go anywhere and talk to anybody, right? I mean, intercourse is the source of society, and I still believe in having one uh, for now. Um, secondly, the last time you had me come and speak, Ron, uh, I was in an under-conditioned church basement. These guys have invited me to a yacht club, so I'm going to go check it out. <laughs> I hear there may be canapes. We're going to see how this how this goes. I'll report back. So here I am. You know, when I looked at the, uh, you know, I've been an election lawyer now for 15 years or so, and it used to be something I did for two months every two years, right, between Labor Day and Election Day. That was the sole locus, and the chances of there being a recount or a contest were literally zero. Um, now it is, uh, not only is it my full-time job, I left my firm, opened my own firm, and this is what I do for a living, right? My first managing partner said to me, you want political law? You'll never make any money at that. And here I am. Not as much money as you, but I, but I, you know, I do okay. So um, when I looked at the description of our, of our uh, panel here, and I, it, it's, it's, it, it struck me, as immediately reasonable, and I was very happy about that, because I come from a world in which you're constantly being yelled at about either voting access or about voter fraud. Um, but the sort of opening lines were that election lawyers on the left focus on securing and expanding voting access, and lawyers on the right focus on ensuring the integrity and accuracy of the process, of voting access and election integrity, <clears throat> or by the sort of crass names, uh, what we call them when we're not up on panels, Suppression versus fraud, right? This, this sort of twin Cain and Abel, and depending on your particular perspective, which one is Cain and which one is Abel is up is up to you. But you know, I said to myself, it's, it's sort of written down. It's, it's <laughs> all Cain and Abel, isn't that written down? <laughs> it caused in my in my it, it, it sort of caused me to look inward for a moment and, and think, you know, am I really concerned about that? And are my colleagues, who are Republican election lawyers in Nevada, are they? concerned with that? Because I don't really know. I, I mean, as a person, I'm not really. But we, you know, lawyers aren't concerned with much other than whether or not our clients understand the concept of an evergreen retainer. <laughs> but we represent and we reflect and are instruments of a client community. And it's absolutely true that my client community uh, is concerned with voting access and, and the franchise. And I believe it's also clear that my colleagues, client communities, are very concerned with the specter of voting regularities, accuracy, and fraud. But you know, these 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 two twins, right, which which now we sort of say the left cares about this and the right cares about that, they grew out of the same pool, right? They climbed out of the same soup, um, which was historically a quest for political power, to get it and to keep it over time. And it was not necessarily partisan. In fact, it was only, either one of them would have been incidentally partisan, right? They were, uh, you know, the franchise 
for example, that the history of enfranchisement or voting access was a, was a fraught process, but it was always pro uh, progressive in the forward thinking and developing way from white male property owners to universal male suffrage, the 19th Amendment, the Civil Rights Movement. Now, the sort of advent of easier registration and record keeping and all those things. But uh, the, the, the fights against increased access, the disenfranchisement of, of, of people, could not really be described as partisan, right? They had other bases. And that's also necessarily true uh, about fraud and election tampering. There is a very rich tradition of electoral fraud and election stealing in this country. It is, thankfully, in more of our past, right? Um, but it was localized. It had to do with machines keeping power in your particular space. It wasn't weaponized as Republicans versus Democrats. And, and uh, uh, each party didn't necessarily think of the other as being behind that or, 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 or conspiratorial. It was, I mean, I mean, it had to do with the, the development of technology at the time or the processes. Most people don't realize that the Australian ballot, secret ballot, didn't come up, uh, you know, didn't start until the late 19th century, and I think it was the middle of the last century before it became uh, sort of widespread across the entire country. And the, uh, uh, to sort of demonstrate that electoral fraud wasn't necessarily partisan, the most famous it, uh, it, uh, it example of a stolen election is probably comes from the 1948 Texas Senate election, uh, which you can read about in uh, the second volume of uh, Caro's biographies of LBJ. If you were going to steal an election in the South up until the 1960s, you were going to steal a primary from another Democrat. It was, in essence, uh, intramurals, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then, so since, the, you know, since, say, 1970 or so, we seem to, or, or between 1970 and 2000, we sort of hit a period in which these concerns may have existed lo in, in, in a localized way, but they weren't at the forefront of people's understandings of how the process worked. Right? I mean, when I, the first time I went to, with my mother to a firehouse to, do uh, you remember those old machines you used to walk into and flip the metal thing and the, and, the, and the curtain would go behind you and then you'd pull the lever and clear it through? When I got to go do that to pull up for George McGovern in 1972, nobody had it cross their mind about the process or the, or the potential for fraud behind those things. Right? It was, uh, well, of course, now looking back, those things were like the equivalent of, you know, the electoral iron lung. How did we vote on those things, right? Those things were, 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 were I, I have no idea whether they were easy to uh, commit fraud on, but they were certainly weird things to uh, uh, collect votes on. But we made it through that process from, say, 1970 to 2000 without these things bubbling up into weapons of electoral war. In fact, you know, here we are in this wonderful venue. Ronald Reagan won his, 90, his uh, 1980 election by eight and a half million votes. Don't remember a single whisper that there was a problem with that number. Joe Biden won his election by seven million votes. And I think we all know the narratives that surround that. Right? So something has changed drastically. And you know, we, we were brought here today to talk about the trust of the people. And I want to get to that because I, I, I've, I've been forcing myself to confront whether and how much I care about that. <laughs> not because it's not important, and it, 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 uh, it doesn't symbolize a certain rot or decay in our democracy, because it does. But rather, as, as, as Audrey rightly pointed out, the evidence for widespread disenfranchisement or widespread voter fraud is so scant that if, 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 if someone intensely believes that, or entire communities intensely believe that, I'm not really sure we can do much about it. So when I get into those situations, I force myself to think, OK, what ought I, as an attorney, be doing? Uh, what, 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 I, uh, what should I be urging my clients uh, or, or my community to be thinking about these kinds of things? Because on some level, it strikes me like wondering or not uh, whether the Nazca lines uh, were placed there by aliens. You want to believe that, that's fine, right? The lines are still there. Right? The election still gets held. Your vote's going to get counted. And I especially believe that because I come from a state that has sterling gold standard, gold standard elections, right? Nevada has 
fantastic elections. Now, to my mind, and this will be a little test for you all, a sort of Rorschach test, a little, uh, um, um, like, a, how this, how, how each of these land in your, in your belly may be, may, be, may be telling for you. Because we have uh, automatic voter registration. Anytime you deal with the DMV, you are registered. Uh, we have same-day registration in Nevada. We have universal mail uh, ballots. We have vote centers. You can go anywhere in your county and cast your ballot. We have drop boxes. We have ballot collections. Right? Now, it strikes me that if all those were the collection of evils that themselves could open up to fraud that would affect an election, Nevada would be one place where it would be happening, where you would have that evidence. And yet, we don't have that evidence. <coughs> But at, at the moment, Clark County, but especially up in Washoe County, there is a locus of um, resentment and anxiety regarding the election process that is reaching a fever pitch. In fact, we talked a moment ago uh, with the last panel about the prospect of uh, political violence towards elected officials, especially judges. It strikes me that, that, that right now, the season and issues around elections are the, are the hot zone for political violence, for one reason or another. And I don't think that can be explained you know, just from lack of trust. Lack of trust is a symptom of that. But let me also say this, going back to these twin uh, voting access versus election integrity, obstacles to voting versus the accuracy of voting. And though they came out of the same world of seeking p political power, they're not really commensurate now either, right? There's one is systemic, right? I mean, if someone's putting up obstacles to voting, it's 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 not that they're being <coughs> attacked at the polls or the polling places being shut down or the or the you know, the act of voting. Uh, it's it's legalistic, right? Well, I can attack that in the courts or on or, or on behalf of my clients, or prophylactically, I can get my legislature to create other ways in which voting access can be, can be uh, expanded. The voter fraud side of it, the election integrity side, feels like something else. It's figmentary, but it means something to an awful lot of people. Uh, and we need to deal with that, and we can sort of talk about that, and I'm actually very interested to hear what, what, you know, what Stephen has to say on the sort of practical level. But what we're fighting about now, myself and my Republican colleagues, it's, it's sort of not these large issues. We're wrestling around the margins of process, right? In Nevada, we are, uh, uh, we are defending the ground we have won in recent <coughs> legislative sessions. Uh, we are, are dealing with um, how many voter sites there'll be, how many machines will be at those sites so the lines aren't long. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are dealing with the post office because we have an all mail, almost all mail. Right? We want the speed of the mail and the, and, the, uh, and the delivery and efficiency to increase. On the right, my colleagues are fighting over um, signature verification, for example. Um, there is an obsession with observation to a point that I think is probably unhealthy. Um, uh, there's an obsession with clean voter rolls. There's an obsession with the speed of results, which I also don't entirely get. Right? I mean, it's, it's, there's, a, there's an immediacy, and the lack of immediacy signals to, to some people that there are problems with the election. I'd rather get it right than get it quickly. So it seems to me that, the, is, that, that if I can return to these twin themes, that it's sort of like those contraptions, like the finger locks now that you see in, in the sort of novel stars, stores, where if I, anything that I would do to increase voter access, would potentially be seen by my counterparts uh, as likely to increase the prospects for voter fraud. And anything they do to increase what they see as election integrity would strike me and my clients as potentially reducing by some quantum access and the franchise. I don't know how to get out of that lock. Uh, because as I said earlier, you know, I want to care about voters' trust in the process. I don't know how to do that otherwise than exuding my confidence in the process. Because, you know, I don't, I could take somebody, I'm sure all of us could, take somebody on a tour of the election center. 
I could show them the lifespan of a ballot from blank paper off to the printer to locked away after the election in the vaults. And you could do all that and show them. These are all the safeguards. These are all the things you can do. Our registrar likes to say, um, you could drop 100,000 of these ballots from a helicopter onto the city. It wouldn't change the results one bit. That's how much confidence they have in their election processes. And I say to myself, well, I, it's not really about trust in the process. It's about trusting each other. Uh, it, it redounds to fears. <clears throat> the problems we have with trusting the other process are fears regarding what the other side is willing to do to gain power, right? Or fear of what capacities they may develop in order to gain or keep power. And that's something that, you know, no panel is going to be able to resolve. That's a society-wide problem uh, that, of which some mistrust of the electoral process is merely a one of many symptoms of a much deeper malady. All right, great. Yeah. Fantastic. Tim, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, fantastic. Works out well. Okay. Paul, I know there's a good Arizona crowd, and uh, I know in Arizona we've been talking about election administration a lot over the last three years, so appreciate your indulgence. I've interacted with elections in a number of different capacities, first as a volunteer for the Rudy Giuliani 2008 presidential campaign. I was later deposed against him, um, so funny how the world works. I've been an election attorney, I have been a Republican Party observer, I've been a candidate, and I've been an election administrator. And Judge Liberty said, why don't you talk about your perspective as election administrator? Why don't you play the role of the technocrat? And I said, you mean like Mitt Romney? Be still my beating heart. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you about the role uh, as a technocrat. But Andrew, I'm sorry, I, I think you wanted me to tease out some disagreement points, but I largely agree with everything that the two panelists said before me. So, um, so we'll get instead into some of those administrative points. So as from an administrator's standpoint, I think we're in a better place than we've ever been in the history of the United States. As mentioned by Bradley, our country has a rich history of both voter fraud and voter suppression, but those have become increasingly rare over the past 30 years, and all academic studies sort of uh, support that. Um, on the point of fraud, every election jurisdiction is different, but we can take comfort in the following generalized systems and generalized rules about election administration. First, we have a highly federalized system. There are over 8,000 voting jurisdictions in the United States, meaning that it's impossible to flip one switch and you affect all the jurisdictions. It is impossible to get to one person and have an effect on the whole country. It is impossible to change one computer program and have a change on the whole country. I think that's a good thing. Although there have been some movements to make our system more federalized. Two, all election jurisdictions are bipartisan. There is no jurisdiction in the United States where it is only run by Democrats or only one run by Republicans. By law, there has to be bipartisan people at all stages of the process. Three, paper ballots. After the Hayne Chad phenomenon in the Bush versus Gore race, there were a lot of jurisdictions that experimented with electronic voting, whereby you would automate, you would just mark your choices on an electronic screen, they would just take out a drive, then that drive would be taken to the central server and your results would be uploaded. A lot of people who are election integrity advocates and a lot of election security professionals said no, no, no. And over the last few years, we've seen a significant shift back to paper ballots. 93% of Americans now vote on a paper ballot. Why is that good? Because you have a paper auditable trail that you can go back to if you ever have any questions and it cannot be hacked. Four, transparency. All jurisdictions have observers at some levels. I think the parties have really stepped up in recent years to have observers at every sinking step of the process, whether it's at a voting location, and if you're at a voting location 27 days before the election, it is boring. Bring your crossword puzzle. But people are there, they're watching, they're watching at central count facilities, they're watching signature verification, they're watching duplication boards, they're watching processing boards, 
and technology has allowed us to make that process even more accessible. We borrowed from the uh, Washington DC National Zoo where you could go online and you could watch the pandas at any time of day. Now you can watch the election officials at any time of the process on our website, elections.maricopa.gov. Machine tabulation. Almost all jurisdictions in the United States now tabulate by machines. Machines have gotten more and more sophisticated. They are accurate within a very, 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 very high percentage. It's just like when you were taking the LSAT, unless you're really, really young, you filled out those bubbles, it went to a Scantron. They're accurate within 99.999%. Human hand counters, by, con by contrast, are much less accurate. Six, pre-election testing. All jurisdictions do some level of pre-election testing of equipment. Seven, post-election audits. Now this differs a little bit and not every jurisdiction in the United States does it, but most jurisdictions do some level of post-election audits. For some jurisdictions like Maricopa County, that can look like bipartisan teams hand counting a statistically significant number of the ballots to make sure the machines worked as they were intended to. For other jurisdictions, this will be a risk limiting audit, which is something that's descended on the elections world recently. For other jurisdictions, this will be a top to bottom, full look at the election process. And then lastly, eight, I think, did I number those right? Hopefully, eight, it doesn't really matter. Legal process, and I hope that this is not lost on this crowd in particular, and especially Judge Liberty knows this because he has both litigated some of those election challenges and he has presided over some of those election challenges. You can raise an election challenge before the election, you can raise an election challenge after the election, and that is a good thing, that is a healthy thing to be able to have that litigation process. Lots, lots more, but those are the broad strokes. My own assessment is that the election systems across the United States are not perfect, and they're especially not perfect when it comes to garden variety fraud. Like, if you've moved and they haven't taken you from a previous jurisdiction, maybe voting in two different jurisdictions. If mom died two days before early ballots went out, but you know what mom's signature looks like. You grab mom's ballot, you, put, you fill it out, you put her signature on it, and you send it back. But generally speaking, I think that election systems are very good at catching <coughs> broad, significant, election-changing level fraud. On the accessibility front, we've seen a remarkable amount of goalpost shifting over the last few years, in the last 30 years. I think if you would have gone to left-leaning public interest groups in the 1990s and you would have portrayed the world as it is today, they would have said, we've reached nirvana, we have done it. Um, but that is not the case uh, now. I mean, uh, there's thoughts, I feel like some days I need to give you a massage while you're filling out your ballot for people to be happy. Not really, but yeah. Um, almost every state allows no excuse early voting. Almost every state allows some form of mail voting. Almost every state has at least some weekend voting. Almost every state has accessible voting devices for those with visual or audio needs. Many jurisdictions, including my office, will mail voters braille ballots or large print ballots if they request them. Many jurisdictions, including mine, will send bipartisan teams to nursing homes if you cannot mark the ballot yourself and you will orally relate it to the Republican and Democrat who will fill it out and bring it back. Not a great cost benefit analysis, but it's something that we do. <laughs> Most jurisdictions have information that has never before been accessible, such that in my jurisdiction, you can go online, you can type in your address, you can see all near voting locations and you can see the wait times for those voting locations. So, and yet, despite all of this, and despite <coughs> both what I've seen empirically and anecdotally, that we're in the best position maybe in the history of this country, the volume and intensity of rhetoric concerning election administration has never been higher. In 2021, President Biden responded to some pretty <laughs> minor administrative changes to election law in Georgia, calling it Jim Crow 2.0. In 2022, Georgia had the highest turnout it's ever had in, mid in a midterm election, and African American turnout was on par with what it had been in the past. In 2020, President Trump endorsed a theory that Hugo Chavez controlled a company that created tabulation machines <coughs> used in the United States that would switch votes from Trump to Biden. That's an idea that would only be taken seriously in politics. So why this disconnect between what we're seeing empirically 
the improvements in election systems, and what the rhetoric is suggesting. And I think it's simply what Audrey suggested that politicians have really recognized this as something that they can tap into, and public interest groups too, for their pecuniary benefit and for their electoral benefit. And maybe it's just naive of me to assume that like that happens and that's disappointing. Um, maybe that's just politics. But while certain political actors and interest groups are enriching themselves either financially or electorally, I think that we as a society are holding the cost of that, which is decreased and decreased confidence in this particular institution. And I worry <coughs> how low that can go before we reach a breaking point. So thanks very much. Thank you. So much. Does, does anybody wish to respond to any other panelists? I think we had too much agreement between the three. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question, yeah. if, I, if I can, for uh, Stephen, because I think it sort of plays into, you know, you talk about election day experiences, and I have election day experiences, and I have great appreciation for the people where they're you know, doing it as professionals and as volunteers. I think one of the real tragedies of, of, these, of, of what's been happening lately is the difficulty to recruit people to what was routinely seen as a good civic task. So I want to ask you about getting and keeping employees and then getting volunteers uh, or, 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 or paid election workers because, you know, in Nevada and elsewhere, you are probably taking risks. Yep. So, so we hire about 3,500 temporary workers for the general election in Maricopa County. Um, we have actually not had that much trouble. We pay them 15, 16, 17 dollars an hour. Actually in 2022 the challenge was more inflation than it was um, than it was being able to recruit people. We've seen a change in the type of person who will work temp temporarily as an elections worker from somebody who is retired and just civically engaged and wants to be part of the community to somebody who has more of a firefighter mentality that like you want to be part of this process. I also really love it when people with doubts about the election processes come to me and I say, well, why don't you join us? And then that has the, the benefit of hopefully teaching them about the process and then also making them complicit in anything they allege that they do. <laughs> so it's really wonderful. Um, but it is something that is, is, is serious and it's disappointing to me um, that what has happened to the elections community. I'm currently a, a victim in three different federal criminal cases, and, which is a bummer. But, um, you know, and, but we, we, I think the community needs to do more uh, to, to the previous panel to bring the temperature down. I think leaders need to recognize that they have outsized power and I think that they need to be careful with their words because their words do have an inciting effect. And um, I hope that Americans will continue to answer the call as they have in Mar Maricopa County. Stephen, what kind of vetting do you do for election workers, if any? Oh, oh, very, very little. Um, so we don't go online and check your Facebook posts and be like, Stephen has bad hair. It's like, yeah, I know. Um, uh, so we just check to see if they have a criminal history and if they are a registered Arizona voter of the political party that they say they are. Otherwise, we bring them in, we give them training, we embed them in teams of, of different political parties and people of different vintages in terms of how many elections they've worked. It's not just like a group of six buddies comes in and it's like they've all got an agenda and we say, okay, you guys all run this one operation. No, we break them apart, we train them, we tell them how important this is, we make them take an oath of office, and then we embed them into politically diverse teams. Bradley, uh, Stephen brought up that uh, President at one point referred to Georgia's election legislation as Jim Crow 2.0, and the, the resulting hysteria resulted in Atlanta losing the, the uh, was it the uh, All Star Game? Thank you, and that had a tremendously negative impact on that local economy. So, uh, in, in addition to to that, uh, does that really help? Um, other than perhaps lining the um, the treasury accounts of candidates or lawyers, or lawyers. Um, no, it is it is in fact unhelpful that sort of hyperbole. But but while it doesn't help, I I I think one of the things we could, you know, we can all agree here it sells. Um, 
you know, the, the sort of the, the language of disenfranchisement sells on the left in the same way that the language of voter fraud sells on the right. And um, there's no consequence for doing so, right? There's a, uh, well, that, you know, clearly there was an economic consequence, but as far as political capital, it's, it just keeps, you know, paying interest. So until that changes, which I don't see how that can either, um, you're going to see a continued stream. I don't think we'll see more of it because I don't think you can have much more of it, right? We're sort of at capacity. We're just simply not reducing it. And I, uh, you know, there was, I, uh, I think it was Eugene from the last, from the last panel was talking about his, his, his sort of deep pessimism going forward. I share that pessimism in both in the arena he was talking about, but in the arena we're talking about because um, I don't feel like we can go back to uh, the world in which my mother and I in the, in, the, in the firehouse pulling the levers. You just have to go through, right? And be, we, you, you have to build something on the other side. Um, and you know, the good news is we get to help decide what that's going to look like. The bad news is it's going to take a while. It's going to be a fight. And that's just part of it. Any other responses? No? Okay. Well, um, do you think, shall we go ahead? Do you think he would do it again? I, I, I'm going to punt on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if the left um, feels like they overplayed and maybe even damaged their hand on that Georgia one because I just think that the results from Georgia and, you know, when they've been saying, we need to tone down the rhetoric, I, I, I sort of, I've talked to, um, Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., and I guess I was going to say they told me confidentially, but here we are. Um, <laughs> but there were a few that uh, I sort of that said that maybe we overplayed our hand on that. Maybe that rhetoric wasn't the appropriate rhetoric. Yeah, let me, let me, I hesitate, and I know we're sort of talking shorthand here when we say the left overplayed its hand okay. or the sort of right did this. Uh, I can at least say from my side, there is no central nervous system, uh, you know, by telling me what to say or anyone else on the, uh, you know, on my group to say. Well, but all you really need in that circumstance is one guy thinking it's good for him and his race, right? And uh, as long as that currency spends, uh, would they do it again? Probably. Back in 2008, uh, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called Crawford versus Marion County Board of Elections. And in that case, Justice Stevens wrote the court's majority opinion upholding uh, a ballot, ballot security measures enacted by Indiana. Uh, and included in those measures was a uh, voter ID requirement. Now, here we are, uh, well, to, to rewind a little bit, I mean, a six to three decision of the United States Supreme Court just 16 years ago with Justice Stevens as the author upholding voter ID. And now, fast forward to today, here we are where this is a very, very polarized uh, subject matter. So, uh, Mike Chris, Mike, I'd like to address this topic to Audrey. Um, what happened in the intervening 16 years? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. So you had, after the 2000 election, um, obviously concerned about these things were starting to rise. Uh, and you had the Carter Baker Commission, which came up with a series of proposals. And voter ID was one of the big ones. Um, it was a bipartisan commission. They had a bunch of hearings. They talked to a lot of experts. And they decided, OK, voter ID is something that's a good idea. Um, then you had the Help America Vote Act that passed that required voter ID in certain situations. And uh, after that, some states decided they wanted to institute voter ID, which has generally been a very popular thing with the public. If you do a poll of the public, and these numbers are a little old, and I don't, I think they're pre-2020, but about 80% of the electorate thought voter ID sounded like a good idea. You, know, you have to have ID for all kinds of things, why not voting? That seems to make sense. Whether it makes a big difference in the security of elections or not, I think has not really played out in the, in the studies but it makes people feel more confident that somebody's not stealing their vote if they have to show some sort of identification. 
Um, and then you had this Crawford case in 2008 where Indiana had instituted this voter ID law. It was pretty reasonable. If you didn't have a voter ID, you, if you didn't have a driver's license, you could get a free ID card from the state. There were certain things in it that allowed almost anybody to get an ID. And the reason why um, you had Stevens in the majority on this is because the, the other side couldn't show any evidence that this was gonna prevent anybody from voting. They had really nothing to show. They had some anecdotal stories, but they didn't have any evidence um, to show that voter ID, this particular voter ID law was going to stop anyone from voting. And then you, you go forward and more and more states are implementing these voter ID laws. And a lot of them are more restrictive than Indiana's law. Um, some of those have been struck down in court. Uh, but voter ID laws generally, um, hadn't been partisan and now they're a huge partisan issue and I I would ask you know Brad why he thinks that is as well because it in, in I think a lot of the population's mind that's a good idea but uh, we get a lot of pushback from the left on it saying this is going to prevent so many people from voting. No, I think that you know voter ID is actually one of those issues that makes people on the left slightly uncomfortable because they know it's popular. <coughs> Right? Those numbers are exactly correct. It's also true that you know, people in our socioeconomic world don't know anybody who doesn't have an ID. Right? I mean, we all have an honest right now. You reach in your pocket. Somebody said, we're voting today. Everybody in this room could pull out an ID. There it is. We're ready to go. No problem. But we don't live in everybody else's shoes. Um, uh, you know, I also think that this is one of those issues that, is, that speaks to the cosmetic and the trust issue, as opposed to anything actually substantial. Nobody is impersonating you at the polls. In the rich history of fraud in American elections, impersonating somebody to steal one vote is the single dumbest way, <laughs> right? The only, the only way that could matter is if, you know, a handful of you and, and you were somehow able to engineer a razor-close election, right? A note about razor-close elections. Uh, to my fellow election lawyers, I recommend them. They're incredibly lucrative. <laughs> but I can't engineer them. So, you know, and, and, and it, there's sort of an inverse um, relationship, right? Because the larger the election, the less impersonating someone or small-scale garden variety voter fraud matters with the result. And the smaller the jurisdiction or the election, the less likely you're going to get away with it because you're walking into a place where they probably know you. Right, so you know it's 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 an uncomfortably popular thing for me because if it's not solving anything, and if I can convince myself I don't really care so much about the confidence issue, if it takes one person, twenty people, a thousand people, and they find it harder to vote, was it worth the boost in 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 voter confidence when I know that those who are who are not confident in our election processes? We'll find other locus, uh, uh, another locus of fraud, whether it's the ghost in the machine, the algorithms, or it's the registration fraud. There'll be something else, which is why you know this whole trust issue. I feel like we are we are dogs snapping after a car that will never stop, right? Because if if it's trust that we're trying to get to or restore, and someone only has to say, "I'm not satisfied yet," what, what is the end point? So. I, I agree with you that the, the in-person fraud is really, really rare, right? That's not, that's and, not uh, what we think. And, and very stupid, yeah. yes, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I don't necessarily agree that we shouldn't care about voters' confidence in elections, especially on something like voter ID, where such a big percent of the population wants it and thinks it's a good idea. I do think you are right that the fringes will always, on both sides, are always going to be angry about something with elections. There's always going to be people who say, too many votes are being suppressed, too much election fraud is going on. But the regular everyday voter, the people who are not in this room, the people who just go about their business and only pay attention in 
you know, presidential cycles, maybe they vote on in congressional cycles and don't really care, don't pay attention. Voter ID is something that does increase their confidence in voting. And I think those people I care about a little more or a lot more than the fringe people who, like you say, are just gonna keep trying to push yeah. the edges. No, that's fair. That's a well-taken comment. And you know, I mean I'm being flippant when I say I don't care. What I what I mean to say is that in the range of priorities that suffuse my tasks, that's a that's a that's a lesser one. I, I think the previous panel had a University of Chicago Law School person as well. So do you remember Professor Lavmore when he would say, is that really the type of lawyer you want to be? Um, when you would say something that was, uh, that was easy, that was a cop-out, um, and he, he would push you on it. And, and one of the things I appreciate about the Federal Society is sort of the intellectual rigor. Um, and I'm not just pandering here, but that does have a point. And the, and the point is that all the academic literature suggests that voter ID law has at best a at most a negligible impact on people's ability to participate. And I just want us as a society to be intellectually rigorous and intellectually strong enough to say, you know what, it's not happening. And we, and we accept that as, as, as a matter of sort of statistically defined um, fact. And so, I, and yet we can't get past that sticking point. And if we can't get past sticking points like that, then I think that's a, a real condemnation on on where we're at. Well, Stephen, let me ask you uh, a process question. What is it that your office and other offices do to maintain voter rolls? Um, so somebody regretfully passes away a few months before a primary election, they're on the permanent early voting list. Um, there's a ballot that is going to go to that person's house, which may now be owned by somebody else, or a, uh, a son or a daughter might be in control of that house and getting the mail. Well, what are some things that your office does to ensure that only eligible voters are receiving ballots? So voter list maintenance is incredibly important, especially as we're moving as a society more and more to mail ballot by mail, early balloting. Um, there is not a national voter registration database. I think a lot of people think that as soon as you move from one location to another, from one state to another, then the national voter registration database will pick you up and will immediately delete you from one location and, and register you in another location. Um, that idea would have given me great pause as a civil libertarian, as a federalist previously, but now as an election administrator, I'm like, that sounds pretty nice, actually. <laughs> but it doesn't exist. And uh, so, so it is imperfect. Now, where the system is especially imperfect is with respect to moving. When you die, you fill out a lot of paperwork. You don't fill it out. Somebody fills it out for you. Um, and so that actually gets caught in a lot of different governmental databases that are then shared with elections offices. So for instance, we get monthly reports from the Arizona Department of Vital Statistics. We also get it from the MVD. We also get it from the Social Security Administration. We also do daily scans of all major obituaries in the state of Arizona on a daily basis. When you move, however, a lot of people think of a lot of things. Netflix comes up first or something like that. But uh, contacting your local registrar or county recorder is certainly not one of them. And so what states have done is they've gathered some more interstate consortiums to be able to run voter rolls off of each other. They have used those. We use the national change of address forms for the USPS, but you'd actually be surprised at how few people fill out those national change of address forms. And so no, it is a, it is not perfect, but what we do do is when we are sending, when we're registering a new person, we're sending them a voter registration card, and if that comes back as undeliverable, then we can't put that person on the voter registration rolls. If we ever get mail as returned as undeliverable, then we can begin to move you to the inactive process. And then we ask voters. We ask voters themselves to, to help us. So if, you're, if your kid goes away to college and, and you know, maybe isn't going to move back, then we ask you to let you check a little box and return that early ballot to us such that we can begin that inactivation process. Because simply not voting, you're not allowed to remove somebody from voter rolls for simply not voting. And so it's a little bit in tension with some of the nasty historical components of our society that both federal law and most state law jealously guards being able to remove, guards against being able to remove people from voter rolls. But that's the type of stuff that we do do on a daily basis. Can I respond? So I, I think all of those are wonderful things. I care, this is why I care so much about uh, 
voterless maintenance, and also don't really think it's a great idea when states, which more and more states are now doing, send ballots to everyone on the voter rolls. Uh, because what I've seen, especially in California, because we've been doing this, I think, longer than almost anybody, except maybe Oregon, uh, you, I was, I got a call last election cycle from an eight-year-old man who had gotten four ballots in the mail. And he was terrified about voting the wrong one. He had no intention of voting all of them. And we know that this type of thing doesn't necessarily lead to voter fraud, right? Or maybe it's a couple one-offs. Most people aren't going to vote ballots that just show up at their house. Um, and voter registration issues are different than voter fraud. But if you have a voter roll that's extremely out of date, and Californians are notoriously bad, and then you're also sending mail ballots to everybody, that is a problem. Um, as far as voter confidence goes, um, that was our number one call in 2022, was that people were getting extra ballots at their house. Or they had moved to Texas five years ago and they still got a ballot in Texas. How, I, and I don't know how all of these things happened, but I think that is something that you hear stories about. And that's another thing that really hurts voter confidence. As far as the people who aren't on the fringes or really into these issues, if they hear about somebody getting four ballots at their house, they're going to be worried that people are voting multiple times and their voter their vote's going to get diluted. So there, there, there's a catch for that, but I won't deny that that's going to damage somebody's confidence. So every single early ballot return envelope will have a barcode that has to link to a voter registration profile, and that gets scanned in as soon as it's sent back, and that has a vote loaded to a profile. So if you try to send back four, then it won't be able to load the other three. That being said, still damaging to voter confidence. So I certainly uh, um, uh, agree with that thought, and just sort of generally speaking, what, that we need to do more in terms of voterless maintenance, but it also brings up sort of the conceptual design theories of do we want sort of a, an ex-ante system or do we want an ex-ante regulatory system or do we want an ex-post law enforcement system? And so when I tell you about those garden varieties of fraud that do happen, one reaction would be, well, we need to do more checking of every single voter before the election and we need to build the apparatus, the regulatory apparatus to be able to do that, or on the back end, we compare lists with different states, and if somebody's voted in multiple jurisdictions, then we refer that for criminal prosecution, and if we make in enough of those, then we will have that ex post regulatory effect. Bradley, do you want to have the last word on that? We'll turn it open to audience questions. Yeah, it's still, you know, it's still, I, I, I still wrestle all the time with, with, with the voter confidence issue. When it's when it's when it's potentially not backed up by some substantial danger or problem. I mean, it is is clearly. I want average people to think that their vote is counted. It's counted quickly and accurately, and that the people who are who, who are in office are there because they got the most votes. Everybody wants that. The I mean, the 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 ways in which now we can track ballots. And stop double voting and all those. And, and you should see if you've never had a chance to see a signature matching machine in action. It is a phenomenal technological thing. Um, but you know, phenomenal t technological things oftentimes can be misunderstood or slightly scary to certain people. Same thing with the with the list maintenance, right? The the uh, what's the what, uh, is it Eric. Eric. Yes, right. Now, you know, Eric is now the subject. That's a, uh, what's, what does Eric stand for? Uh, electronic Registration Interstate Consortium. Yes, so you sort of share information that, yep. that sort of helps you deal with, with um, um, you know, multiple registrations, right? You sort of clean up your list. But now that's the subject of, of conspiracy theories. How, how that works, I haven't, I don't, I don't take the time to actually follow out these theories, but I know they're out there and they're significant. There are states that are pulling out of that consortium, the very thing that could objectively help clean the lists. So the sort of list of priorities I have uh, is very long and placing all of these issues uh, that, that, that may increase confidence but do nothing, I have sometimes trouble uh, sort of sliding them in uh, higher than other people I think would like. Okay, thank you panelists. Let's begin with audience questions. Lots of hands in the air but uh, the microphones, where might they be? All right, thank you. All right, let's uh, go to the gentleman in the back. I know you have a microphone. Hi, Eric Heides in the LA chapter. 
One of the accusations that was leveled against Brian Kemp in the 2018 election was that he was the Secretary of State and was running for higher office, but Secretaries of State in most states are themselves elected officials. So I was curious of the panel's thoughts of whether election administrators should be elected or if it's worse if they're appointed by someone who is an elected official. No, they shouldn't be elected. But no, Brian Kemp did nothing wrong because he did what every Secretary of State has done. We had this phenomenon in Arizona with our now governor was the former Secretary of State. And it, it does create, again, it creates an optics thing. And I think that now that this is such a challenging thing optically um, that we should revisit that. And I also think that um, the skill set that's needed as a politician is awfully grossly divergent from the skill set that is needed as an effective administrator. Um, I say that as an elected administrator, and I'm sure in my case they correspond perfectly. But um, yeah, so, so I, I'm very really skeptical of that. Um, in the West, we became of age during the progressive era, and so we love electing stuff, direct control over democracy. We have a state mine inspector who's elected. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, but I don't like it. Uh, I refer you to Clint Bullock for more history about Arizona and whether or not that's a good thing. Um, I also, oh, I, I also see problems with having them appointed, right? Especially if the, uh, the governor or whoever can fire them if they don't do what they want. Um, and there's been some problems with that as well. But then if you have a bad actor, how do you get rid of them if you don't allow the governor to fire them? So I think both have their problems and I'm not necessarily sure what the solution is. Yeah, yeah in, uh, in Nevada we have, we have, which I'm sure is true in most places, we have uh, uh, a bottom-up election system. We essentially have 17 counties. We have 17 elections, much like we have 50 elections, 50 state elections, making up a federal election. But you know, for consistency's sake, I should say I don't like it, and I, it, 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 it probably does harm confidence. But we haven't had any problems with it yet. Um, George is a top-down, oh, which was made well, that was interesting. Meaning, the Secretary of State chooses the election equipment that is used in every single jurisdiction in Georgia, as opposed to a state like Arizona or Nevada, where the counties who are administering the elections make the decisions as far as what type of equipment and whatnot that they're going to use at bottom up state. Along with a whole other range of yeah. local choices. Yeah. We'll go on to the next question. There's a question on the side of the room here. Hi, Adam Nikolai, Nikolai Law Firm, El Segundo, California. Uh, thank you. And what I'm hearing from the panel here is on a surface level, there's very minimal election fraud or election suppression, in fact and uh, the, our elected officials and their agents are going out of their way to tweak systems and improve and minimalize it even further, and yet there's still widespread distrust. And I think if we dig beneath the surface, it's more of a societal and cultural problem we have in our country. We have, we have a society that loves and in fact is addicted to toxicity, hatred, drama, and, I, and, and it's very sexy and profitable, so I think it feeds into you know, th this getting to be so widespread and inflamed as far as the distrust is concerned. And what I'm wondering is, I know it's not anyone's particular job on their own to do this, but are you seeing uh, at the elected officials le uh, level and, and their administrative agencies. And these, these people we entrust with great power, are you seeing any efforts on a bipartisan, uh, from a bipartisan approach to tell people to tone down their toxicity, try from a leadership level to uh, you know, try to curb some of the toxicity that really leads to this, a lot of just BS and false allegations and, you know, causes the problem in the first place. And maybe that needs to be done despite the profitability of all of this drama. Uh, I, I agree completely with the, uh, the hypothesis. Um, I do think that this is a social and cultural issue. Um, there are groups like Braver Angels that will try to bring people together to have bipartisan conversations. There are certainly 
conversations that election administrators are trying to have with their communities to try and get more buy-in, more faith. Um, all I'll say is good luck with that in 2024. Um, I mean, there are certainly, like you said, groups that are doing this, like the, the governor of Utah, Spencer Cox, uh, has this bipartisan initiative to, I can't remember what it's called, but be nicer, basically. And um, I, I don't see them getting a lot of media attention or traction, right? Like, the media doesn't like these things, and so we can just blame it all on the media, I guess, uh, that, that these, these efforts are happening. Uh, in certain areas, but they they don't get talked about a lot. And a lot of these actors are not controllable. I mean, it, it, you know, think of think of a registrar in Clark County, for example, where I'm from. You know, they are they will they will take you, th they will give you public tours, they will show you everything, they will speak ad nauseum about every aspect of it. But you can't bring people there, <coughs> right? And you know, maybe you can have certain actors, political actors, come together. Like the whole Carter, Jim Baker thing was a really great idea because there were hardly two people who could be, who could be less identified or more identified with their, with their partisan histories than those two. So that was, uh, that was very positive. We haven't really done much uh, on those suggestions either. But a lot of the people that are, that, that are profiting from this are not facing voters, right? They are, they are, they are private actors. And so getting them to stop what's working for them to build their little local power base or to, or to, or to whatever it is they're achieving from this, um, it's sort of very difficult for other politicians or registrars to stop or to stanch that in a way that would be effective. Just because we're here, empirically your, your, your statement is supported regarding polarization. But just 1984, Ronald Reagan won every single state except for Minnesota, right? I, I mean, just the notion that in the next 12 years we could have a presidential candidate win 49 states is just now has become so foreign um, that something has definitely fundamentally changed besides Ronald Reagan being pretty awesome and unique. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, lots. Okay. Go yeah. to, in, in the back. So I guess it's Ma'am, in the back. Um, I'm Karen Beaver from San Diego. The, the first thing I want to say, all people are proud, is I've actually been the person running polls. I got to tell you, super experience, and I think everyone should do it. You get a whole different idea about voting and elections and everything else. But my question is for Brad, and I'm not going to mispronounce your name. Um, I was uh, working the phones for election coverage in Clark County in 2020. And first I get a call from this poll worker, and she says, two to three hundred Biden people have showed up, and it was the busiest poll, big long line in Clark County, and they're screaming and yelling and running out the line with cookies, and people are leaving the line like there's no tomorrow. So, all right, so I had them send out a lawyer. The lawyer calls me up. She says, there's 300 of them. And there's one of me. What am I supposed to do? But people are leaving the line like there's no tomorrow. Imagine you're, you know, a little old lady like me, and you've got 300 people screaming at you. What was I supposed to do? What, what was supposed to happen? Because I understand you're not supposed to approach people in the line in Nevada. That's right. Well, it's, there's, there's a hundred foot line where you can't election here, right? So you are allowed to give people water, cookies, or hot dogs, and those things. These people were leaving the line because they were <laughs> a, afraid of physical attack. Well, yeah, there the, were What was the cookie part? Miscellaneous of them running at people in the line. Okay. They were like, how do I know the next one's not going to hit? Okay. You know? I mean, Look, that's, I mean, that sounds like something I would have heard of. I'm not saying it didn't happen. It sounds like the kind of thing that would have crossed my desk on, an, on election day if there was, if you're, if you're describing a near ride. Well, I'll take your card, if I go back to you know. <laughs> No, that's, that's too well, you know, take, Give it to your friends as well. Um, <laughs> I'll make you copies. No, clearly, look, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I don't know really how to respond other than I would never stand for that. And... That's, there are very few reasons why law enforcement should be 
at a polling place, right? Very few reasons. In fact, in Nevada, we are essentially allergic to it, right? We don't, we don't permit that, right? This is clearly one of those, I mean, if, 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 if people are threatened or feeling threatened, I would call them myself, no matter whose supporters they were, because that's not the sort of, that's not the sort of, uh, 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 you know, I don't do business that way. So if, if in fact that does happen again, uh, or it can be documented previously, uh, I would be your guy. Okay. Um, quick, quickly, I would also say in that situation, because I've done the Clark County gig a few times, you want to call the registrar and see if he can get some of the workers to kind of calm down the crowd. That would be the first thing I would do because you don't you don't want law enforcement. I'm guessing this was one of the big early voting sites exactly. where there's lots yeah. of room. It's like a grocery store or something like that. Yeah, and a stadium or something, athletic something. Or yeah, something like that where there is that kind of room for people. And I and and because it's early voting, those people have other opportunities to vote, so it's not quite the crisis it would be on election day, but if you can call the registrar and make sure it doesn't happen again and kind of get it calmed down, that's generally the best way to deal with that. You actually dealt with that much better than I did. I, I, I think this also tees up one of the most interesting legal questions that this field will have to deal with in the next few years, which is the intersection of voter rights and voter intimidation with First Amendment law. And in fact, this was a case before Judge Liberti, and he handled it very ably, but uh, it was a very hard question, which was we had some people who were wearing tactical gear, had guns, and video cameras outside of a drop box. I mean, let, let me, let me, because I'm the one who heard the evidence. <laughs> there was one photo of two people who met that description. Okay. Okay. But go on. <laughs> so... To, 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 some, to at least one person, this was intimidating. I'm trying to be careful here. Um, what is, what do, is that First Amendment protected speech? Is that voter intimidation? I think that those, that tension will be tested more in 2024 and beyond. And it will be interesting. Okay, uh, one more question maybe to this gentleman up front here. You've, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, yes. Uh, can, can we get a microphone because we're recording this? Sure. Can you get a microphone to please? Thank you. Um, my name is Rick Moskowitz. Um, I live here in Los Angeles County. I'm a member of the Los Angeles chapter. I had my own election day experience in 2020. And what happened then was uh, we received a ballot at our house that was addressed to the previous owner of the house who had moved to Vermont 10 years earlier. Um, <clears throat> and I tried to, to report this to our local authorities and specifically to our local election supervisor. And it, <clears throat> and it really wasn't taken seriously. The response was basically, well, what do you want me to do? Um, <clears throat> now, we've heard from Ms. Martin that the, the assertion, I believe, is that voter fraud in this country is rare. Rare. And <clears throat> I know from that uh, in Mr. Richard's state, I believe it was, the <clears throat> most recent gubernatorial election, there was a judicial finding that approximately 30 seconds was the amount of time spent uh, verifying signatures on each ballot, 30 seconds per ballot. In <clears throat> Mr. Schrager's state, there was a newspaper columnist who reported that he had done a little experiment where he mailed in some some ballots he knew were fake, and he you know he eventually caught them and warned that the ballots were fake. But roughly half of the ballot, the fake ballots that he submitted, were accepted and were ready to be counted. And so I guess my question is. In a system of universal ballot, universal <coughs> mail-in ballot, in, and especially in states that don't clean up their voter rolls, how do we have confidence 
that voter fraud is rare. If <clears throat> we're not looking for it proactively, and the only way to look for it proactively is <clears throat> to eliminate mail-in balloting. I mean, if you send in a ballot by mail and it's fraudulent, how is anyone ever going to know that? Uh, they absolutely will know that. Well, how they if they know well, that? Well, let's well, hold on, hold on. No, just just hold one on. just one thing. The, explaining this sort of columnist thing because I'm intimately familiar with what you're talking about. <clears throat> A skilled forger is not only going to be able to vote your ballot; it's probably going to be able to sell your house and 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 run up your credit card bill, right? Right. That's a hell of a thing. That could happen. They're probably going to get caught. In the universal mail ballot system, could you get through the first stage? Perhaps. Would you be caught? Absolutely. So we're also talking about the willingness of average people to commit felonies. In, in Nevada, I don't know about your attorney general, your district attorney, whoever it is, you're going to prison for the act of sending in one ballot. You put that in the scales, and you are nearly certain to be caught. Number one, because whoever you're impersonating probably going to try and vote themselves. Or, among those signatures you're trying to forge, it's going to be caught by the machines. All at the risk of felonious behavior that will put you into prison. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the, it is highly unlikely and irrational give, compared to the ease and security and efficiency of mail balloting, because we're still going to have mail balloting. Anybody can call up and, or, or, or put their name down and say, I want an absentee ballot. So unless you're talking about a return to precinct level, have to go to that firehouse one day from 7 to 7, you know, they don't sell alcohol, all, the, all those other things, right? These, these, these one-off anecdotes simply don't stand up in the weight of comparison to the entire rest of the democratic process. All right, but here's the, here's the part of the question that you're not addressing. If I get in the microphone back. <laughs> do you want to well, just, 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 just real quick, sir, real so, quick, so, and then we're going to have to. So in a, in, in a mail-in balloting system, um, there is whatever percentage chance there is of the ballot, the, the fraudulent ballot being screened out. Yeah. But how do you catch the person who sent in that fraudulent ballot? It's a piece of mail. So, so it's dropped in a it's dropped in a drop box. Who's ever going to catch that person? How is that going to happen? Right. So. Um Two things. One, that's d very disappointing that when you called the registrar and that nothing was done about that because the system is imperfect, as mentioned, and it needs to benefit from the input of voters. Um, two, that's every single piece that goes out has a specific piece code. That's what allows you to track it such that if that registered voter who's already been confirmed already has a Social Security Administration identification and everything like that were to try to send back two ballots, then then one of those would get stopped. Now, in this particular instance, this person moved to Maine, it sounds like. Vermont. Vermont. Uh, apologies. Um, and so first, when if you were to try to send that back, th there would still be the signature verifications process, but then there would also be the post hoc process, which is why more of these states need to be sharing after elections who participated in elections, and we need to do hard matches with the last four of your social security and your date of birth, such that if you show up on both California and in Maine, then that gets referred to the attorney general's office, and hopefully those get prosecuted. And then if we're talking about sort of the cost benefit analysis on that, it is a felony in every single state to both forge a, a signature and to, to vote fraudulently, and so I, I, I hope that there are not many people who are saying, you know, casting one vote, and gosh, the state of California is worth running the risk of felonies, but that's how we try to catch it both beforehand, and then that's how why we get referred to for prosecution afterwards. Now, I'm guessing that you've just been sort of shredding that or putting in the trash can because you've been disappointed that referring that to the system hasn't cleaned it up itself, and that's 
really disappointing, and that's where election administrators have to do better if they're going to earn the confidence of voters like you. Well, I think that about does it for you've got one, you've got one more, please. Okay. All right. Carol Mathias from Orange County, and I appreciate uh, your comments, sort of tamping down the uh, doubt and the in the uh, voter in the election in integrity. Uh, I think 36% of the U.S. Uh, has a little bit of a doubt in the integrity lately. Uh, I would just like to ask if uh, stepping back from the U.S. system. If our system, the way it's evolved in the past 5, 10, 15 years, is so great, why hasn't any other country in the so-called developed world adapted this system? For instance, France holds uh, elections same day, 65 to 85 percent participation, yeah. yet they don't actually allow any mail-in voting, more or less. Taiwan just had an election, same thing, same day, uh, in person. Yeah high integrity, uh, voiced by the people. What, what do you say about so, that? So the, the, the France thing is a, is a great point, um, and it's, it's, a lot of people have said, well, it seems like France can have a high percentage of its votes counted immediately, and they do it by, by hand counting. Um, so they have one contest. Um, in Maricopa County, we have upwards of 85 to 90 contests. Um, that makes the counting process, obviously, many times fold. Uh, they turn in a, they turn in a, a color of, of paper and so that expedites the counting process as well. Also, we've decided as a country that our voting rights greatly favor the added convenience. And I think that if you were to now try to roll back all of those, all of those conveniences um, that have been de developed over the last 40, 50 years, I think that you would face a lot of lawsuits, and I think that you would, for better or for worse, lose a lot of those lawsuits. How do you feel about compulsory voting? Uh, uh, Chile and uh, Australia. Uh, and, uh, as a good libertarian, I'm anti any okay. compulsory thing. <laughs> I was just going to point out that historically in Nevada, the GOP fares best in low turnout elections. But that may be, maybe there's no connection. <laughs> Okay, well, we are going to wrap up our panel on that note, uh, unless, uh, Audrey, do you want to respond to that? I'm, I'm good. No? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like we are wrapping up our panel. Thank you to all our panelists. And thank you.